on the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood. It's the St. Louis Realtor Podcast with your host, Adam Cruz. Welcome, welcome everybody to Podcast 18. Today is August 17th, 2015. We're sitting here live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Studios in beautiful downtown Maplewood, Missouri. We're really excited for the show today. We've got a great special guest coming on, Than Merrill, who you probably all know from A&E's Flip This House. And uh, we're excited to get to interview him. Before that, I just want to give a couple quick updates. We've got some all, uh, great information coming up on HermanLondon.com, our company's website. We've had some awesome new realtors join the company lately, so we're really excited about that. We finally have our new property search website up and running. You know, of course, I'm biased, but it's the favorite website I've ever searched for property on other than directly through the MLS. That's wizah.com, W-I-Z-A-H.com. We're still working on our our make an offer section of that website, kind of doing some testing and tweaking, but we'd love it if you would subscribe to our podcast. We're on iTunes, we're on YouTube, the St. Louis Realtor Podcast. The producer's sitting here looking at me saying, don't forget to tell them to like it. And don't forget to tell them to subscribe and all that kind of stuff. So we'd love to have you guys subscribe and listen to the shows. And you can always find our past shows, too, and check those out. And so we're going to jump in right now. We've got Than calling, so we're going to jump into that at this time. Hey, Adam, how are you? It's Dan Merrill calling. Dan Merrill calling. Great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking my call. No problem. So you've probably done a lot of these podcasts. I'm sure you know how it goes. Yeah, I've done, uh, I wouldn't say a ton of them, but I've done, I, I would say, a handful over over the years. So I got uh, more than happy to, to do this. Is, is this podcast, let me kind of understand, is this podcast for you uh, one of the ways that you generate business uh, as a realtor? For for me, this podcast is a few different things. It's kind of an outlet just because I, I like to talk about real estate. You know, it gives me something to talk about. It gives me an opportunity to meet people like you or meet, you know, uh, people in our local town here in St. Louis that are doing big deals, or I've got to interview people that own, you know, real estate magazines and that type of thing. It's, it's helped me get some business. I think it's helped to strengthen some of my relationships because people are like, oh my gosh, he's got his own podcast. Wow. I will use him as a realtor, you know, but also it just helps me learn about all different ways people are doing real estate. And that's kind of what some of my questions will be to you, you know. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we work, uh, I own a brokerage out here, um, a law, and, and I've been a licensed agent myself, so I've worked that side of the business. Um, although primarily over the years, you know, my, my focus of time has been as an investor, but obviously we work hand in hand with, you know, great agents in, in, over the past, gosh, I guess, I guess it's been 12 years now. I forget how, how long I've been doing it, but, uh, yeah, so I'm, Wow. Uh, I think I can talk to, I would assume the majority of people listening to your podcast are agents, thinking about becoming agents or, you know, been agents or, or agents and investors alike. So more than, more than happy to, to talk a little real estate with you. Great. Okay. Well, let's see. I, I heard about you obviously when I started watching your TV show on A&E Flip This House. And then I've heard about you more through your find and flip events. And actually, one of our realtors is a, I guess, a teacher for you guys. He travels. It seems like he travels every weekend to somewhere, and he's teaching the classes for fortune builders. Awesome. Are you we, talking about Darren? Darren Hefkin, yeah, exactly. Yep. Gotcha. And okay. we've got three realtors here who are fortune builders members. So we've, you know, everyone's talking good about it. So far, things Excellent. are good. I guess I, I wanted to ask you, and you're, it sounds like you own a broker yourself, so you might know how to answer this really well, but how can realtors that are interested in working with investors, how can they structure their business so that they can kind of show the strongest support or the best value to investors like you or to investors that are, you know, members of fortune builders? Yeah, no, it's a great question. In fact, realtors uh, are very valuable parts of real estate investors' teams. Obviously, it goes without saying, the majority of houses that are bought and sold in a market happen, you know, through agents on the MLS. And they've been a very integral part of our team for years. So one of the best things an agent can do to position themselves is understand 
a real estate developer or a real estate investor's business model. You know, what are they looking to achieve? Are they looking to buy and hold properties? Um, are if they are, what types of properties are they are they trying to target? What types of returns are they trying to target so that they can provide some of those opportunities to investors? If it's an investor, you know, we have a lot of students who buy and redevelop and flip properties. And the more an agent understands about the business model of the investor, um, the more assistance they can provide to the investor. And that investor can become a repeat client. You know, so the difference between, let's say, a retail buyer or a buyer who, you know, buys a house, you know, once every five years. And that that type of relationship for an agent is every five years a profit center. And the referrals that they generate can be a profit center. Uh, the difference with investors is investors can also create referrals uh, for an agent, but an investor could be, you know, five or six transactions per year for you or, or more, depending on, you know, the experience of the investor, the capital of the investor, and and how aggressive the investor is looking to grow their business. So it's something that, that can provide that. Now, investors are, are different, right? Uh, there's definitely frustrations that can occur when working with investors. If the more an agent knows about what types of properties an investor is looking for, the better. Where the frustration will come a lot of times is investors typically make a lot more offers right. um, that are a lot of times going to be more conservative or lower. And so as long as the agent understands that and understands what types of properties have a higher probability of being a deal for an investor, the better. And the same thing though, from the investor. The investor has to do a good job explaining their business model to the agent and explaining what they do, what types of returns. If the investor doesn't know what they're looking for, you know, and this is, you know, every investor starts out and every agent starts out as a newbie. And they're trying to get a bearing on what types of properties they're looking for, what types of returns they're looking for, um, how they're looking to position their business. So if the investor doesn't do a good job, explaining to the agent, it can be a very frustrating experience for the agent because they might be submitting, you know, 20, 25 offers and not um, getting the investor to raise their offer at all to, to get the, the to, to make it realistic enough to get it accepted. So um, I think there's uh, investors and agents, there's many, many examples through, you know, in every market around the country of it working well. And also there, there can be a lot of frustration if the two parties don't understand each other and what, what they're looking to achieve. So, um, over the years, you know, we've created many relationships with, with agents who have fed us a lot of properties and we've, you know, created long standing profitable relationships. And it's been a great thing for the agent, uh, as well. And, uh, it's a very key part of what we do. What would you say is, I, I was just thinking about this, how can an agent, you know, if I guess so if an agent understands the investor's model, if they understand that, oh, they want to make a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount, then they can narrow down the amount of properties that they send the investor and waste less of their time or, you know. Uh, exactly. I mean, that's one simple thing that they can do. For example, if an investor is looking for a certain type of return on a rental investment, you know, they... They know, let's say they're looking at single family houses and they're looking for a set, you know, investors look at deals differently. Some look at just the monthly cash flow. Some, and so they might be willing to go into areas that other investors won't. Uh, if, if, if an investor is banking all their decisions on what they can take home from a monthly cash flow standpoint from owning that rental property, you know, the cash flow looks different in a, a single family A market versus a single family C market. So if you're in, different parts of St. Louis, there's different property values and there's different types of tenants associated with those properties. So some investors are looking for less cash flow in a better neighborhood with a better quality tenant with possibly the better, a little better probability of long-term appreciation. Right. Another investor may care, not care at all about appreciation and they're looking for, they're looking to maximize their monthly cash flow from that rental. So they might be willing to go into a C area where a tenant uh, is still paying a relatively high rent, but they can acquire the properties for dramatically less. And so it's a different buy and hold philosophy from two different investors. Um, 
on the other side of the equation are investors who buy and redevelop property. So if an investor, sorry, if an agent knows, okay, this investor is comfortable doing up to $50,000 in construction on single family properties, and they are only looking to buy in maybe these five or six zip codes, and they 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 start to narrow down what leads they send or what properties they send to that investor, it makes it very, very easy for that relationship to, to work. If But if the investor doesn't communicate what they want, some investors are new and they say, oh, I'm just looking for a deal. Well, what does that mean? Exactly. You know, a deal, <laughs> a deal means nothing. Uh, a deal buy and hold, you know, what types of tenants are you looking to deal with? So the more questions an agent can ask to help understand an, an investor and the better job an investor can communicate back to an agent, uh, the better off that they can work, you know, the better relationship they're going to have. So uh, that probably gives a little more detail to the question that, that you asked. Okay. Let me ask about the fortune builders and the find and flip events. Actually, our timing is great because you have an event coming up in St. Louis. It starts tomorrow, I believe. So the timing is great for this. I'll I was going to tell everyone they can go to findandflipevent.com if they want to get more information or sign up, right, for your – is it? do you call it a seminar? Yeah. Actually, I can give you a different URL that uh, goes right to the St. Louis area. It's it's Thans, T-H-A-N-S-M-O, like Missouri, okay. event.com. That's Thansmoevent.com. And it has – we're running our, our free informational events Tuesday through – Saturday there in the St. Louis area, and essentially it's a it's a two hour event that gives um, both agents, investors, people who are looking to invest. It gives them some very basic information about how to get started buying and selling and buying and holding properties. And you know we have students of all different levels. We have students who are mom and pop investors who buy and hold, you know, one or two or three properties a year. We have students who uh, buy and redevelop one, two or three properties a year. We have students that do it at a much larger scale. It's a true business, you know, where they're buying and flipping multiple properties a month. They're buying single family apartment buildings. They're multifamily properties. So we have investors on all different scales. But where our students always start is at one of these events. Um, and then at those events, I'm, you know, I'm very transparent. We, we offer a three day workshop where we get into more detail about our business model. And basically that workshop was modeled after what I've done over the past 12 years. You know, I've been lucky enough to, to have, uh, a lot of success as an investor and buy and sell hundreds and hundreds of properties over the years. And I developed a business model for running my business, which is, is very unique. You know, I have 15 team members who work in my real estate investing office. And, you know, we have three project managers, four team members who do acquisitions. We have a sales manager, an office manager. Now, you don't need a business this big to be successful in, in real estate by any means. You know, people can do this on a part-time basis, can start out, you know, just buying a, a couple properties a year and su using real estate as a means to supplement your income. And a lot of people want to take it further. Um, but at, at, the, at the workshops, we're basically talking through a lot of the basics, showing you, you know, where the risks are, because there's absolutely risk in real estate. You know, not every real estate transaction just happens and there's a big profit at the end. You know, it's a business. It should be treated like sure. a business and things can go wrong and, and, and you can definitely run it the right way and it can be very profitable for you. And it really comes down to, you know, how well you're educated, what your your business knowledge is and how you, you put that into motion in, in the market that you're in. Okay. I guess I was curious and I think I, I might know the answer already, but let's say we have 200 people come to your classes here in St. Louis in the next few days. Are they all going to walk out of there going, okay, this is my exact business model. And, and to, to t touch what you said a little earlier, they all want to buy these A properties or are some of them going to say, oh, A's are good for me. Some are going to say C's are good for me. Some are going to say rehabbing is good for me. Or you're just kind of teaching them the tools maybe more? Or? Yeah, the main thing at the two, I mean, in two hours, obviously, you, you understand, Adam, as an agent or as an investor, you're not going to learn any business model in two hours. Right, and oh, yeah, right. People are expecting, 
to walk out of there and all of a sudden in the next week have a property, that's not going to happen. I, I wish we were that good. The focus of the event is really to show you opportunities. A lot of people don't understand the real estate, buying and selling real estate at all. They don't understand how to find a good deal. They don't understand, you know, what are some of the sources of financing that you can use for property. So we give people a very basic overview of, hey, here's the opportunities. Here's the risk. A lot of people walk out of that workshop and say, you know what? Real estate isn't for me at this time point in my life. A lot of people walk out of that workshop and say, wow, you know what? I never realized how much potential there is in real estate. I want to spend a little bit more time studying the market. I want to spend a little bit more time understanding the business model. And for those people that do, we obviously have a three-day more detailed workshop where we're walking through different aspects of our real estate business model and what we do. Um, so we're, we're sharing with people, hey, this is what a flipping business model looks like. Or when I say a business model, I, you know, I don't want to intimidate anybody. This could be one or two properties a year you, you end up doing. Sure. You end up doing it part time. And we have many students who have full time jobs doing everything from, you know, chiropractor to engineer to social worker to, and they do real estate on the side. I, I, I whole, I strongly believe You know, at the very least, if people love what they do, if people aren't really sure, you know, buy a rental property or two over time because it's one of the best ways to start acquiring assets to supplement your income. Uh, You know, look for something that you can either have a property management company manage or you can even self-manage if you want um, that will, you know, provide you a couple hundred dollars in cash flow each month where the tenant is paying down the mortgage each month. You're building equity because maybe you took a bank loan on that property and the tenant's paying that bank loan down. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in any real estate market, let alone the St. Louis market. But if the market, you know, markets go through cycles, but I, I truly believe in the long-term fundamentals of owning real estate long-term and, and what that can do, because the market will go up, it'll go down, it'll go through cycles, but it's a great way of, you know, shorting the dollar. It's a great way of locking in a debt at today's terms. When I say a debt, a, you know, bank financing, paying it off and inflation is going to happen. You know, the way it, what's happening in the U.S. economy, it's one of the best ways to protect yourself from what's happening at the same time. It's a great starting point into real estate investing and it'll only grow from there. So really, you know, what we're trying to do is encourage people to look at real estate as at least a supplement, if not something that they can do long term. And that's that's where people start is at that workshop. Okay, great. And so when I was watching the show, obviously you were more of like a, a buy and flip guy, I guess, right? You guys were buying them, rehabilitating them and selling them. Now, are you still a buy and flip guy or are you more of a buy and hold guy at this point? Uh, we're both. You know, we've always been both. Uh, the show just focused on that side of our business because that was it's more exciting title, right? to the viewer <laughs> than, yeah. than, oh, hey, we got paid on a rental property this month from the tenant. Here's the check. I mean, that doesn't make for that exciting of a show. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all the shows tend to focus on on really the buy and, and flip side. In fact, in in my opinion, it's less sexy. It's It may not be as creative, but from a long-term wealth building standpoint, buying and holding properties, in, in my opinion, is actually better than buying and flipping properties. Buying and flipping properties for us is a way of creating capital that we then turn around and put into buy and hold investments. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of agents, a lot of investors are saying, well, you know, how how, how can you get started if you don't have a lot of capital? Well, you know, Flipping a deal is a great way of generating a profit, but that profit, you know, that that money shouldn't just go back into your bank account because, you know, it's been sitting there at less than 1% interest. Right. Uh, An investor is always looking, hey, how, where can I place money? How can I invest money into something that's going to provide me a much higher rate of return than just putting it in the bank? And for us, if you look at, you know, the long-term dynamics of owning rental properties, if you look at you know your your monthly cash flow or your cash on cash return, you know maybe you put twenty five thousand dollars down on a on a rental property. Let's say you buy it for a hundred grand and you put twenty five grand down. If you look at the cash flow, the tax benefits, and if you factor in appreciation, if you factor in the equity buildup, 
I mean, that those are attractive returns. Even on single-family houses, you know, in average neighborhoods, those are attractive returns. I mean, that's what um, large uh, investment banks are doing right now across the country. They're buying, you know, hundreds and thousands of single-family homes because they understand those returns. So for, for just small mom-and-pop investors, it's a way of, you know, controlling your financial future. So what, to answer your question, we do both. You know, we work on anywhere from 20 to 35 uh, redevelopment or flip projects at a time. That's wow. our inventory that we manage, and we do that mainly in Southern California and San Diego. We do uh, occasionally do joint ventures with other investors across the country in different markets if they find a really unique transaction um, that, that makes sense. Uh, but what we also do is we turn that money over into two things. One, one I found uh, is buying and holding properties. And the other thing that I really like is, is lending money. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of bank, you know, a single family fix and flip. Most banks, most traditional banks won't finance that type of project. And we've found it to be very profitable to also lend money to other investors who are flipping properties because okay. You can earn, you know, high rates of return. So it's a great thing for the lender. And the lender is the person who takes the most risk, not the person flipping the property. The person flipping the property absolutely takes risk, but not as much as the lender does. So banks a lot of times won't finance traditional single family, multifamily fix and flip redevelopment projects. So there's this whole other world out there of private lenders and hard money lenders. And that's what we've been doing to earn rates of return on, on our real estate profits as, uh, over the years as well. So that's something that we touch on, too, at the workshop. Uh, but it's also, it's also just a great way to get your money working for you uh, long term. So that's kind of our, been our business model over the past 12 years. And, and we've, it hasn't changed much. It hasn't needed to change much. Our, the price points that we go into have changed. You know, the, as the market changes, there's opportunities you know, that open up, there's properties, you know, for example, in a market is falling, being in luxury properties is probably the, one of the riskiest niches. So when a market changes, you want to get out of certain niches and into other niches. And I really believe you can make money in any market, but you're going to have to change your business model. You're going to have to change the, the price point of property that you go after. You know, so that's kind of a look at, at, at what we've done over the years. Okay. And I'm going to jump around a little bit, if you don't mind. There was something that from watching the show, and I think the show, I, it was probably a few years ago that I last saw this episode, but there was something that where oh, those two brothers were negotiating with the vendor and they, yeah. they made the vendor sign your guys' contract. And part of the contract, I think, said basically if you don't finish the job by this time, then the, the amount that we owe you goes down a little bit. Yep. I saw that as this lesson, this great lesson that I needed to enact on the properties that I'm doing. And for some reason, I don't do that. I, I just say, okay, plumber, I'll just trust you. You know, here you go. And I was just curious, is that something that you guys still use? Is that something you still recommend? Uh, how does that play out? Absolutely. Um, it's very important when you're doing a rehab or redevelopment project, whether it's a single family, commercial, or you know, multifamily, doesn't matter, that you structure the paperwork with the contractor the right way. When I say paperwork, there's many different you know, I, I could spend an hour and a half just talking about paperwork sure. when it comes to, you know, setting up your rehab projects the right way. You know, the first thing is you have liability. As an investor, you're buying an asset. You know, you're putting money into a property. If, even if you, you know, put twenty five grand down and borrow $75,000 from a hard money lender or a private money lender or a bank, you have equity you put into that project. Then you're trusting other licensed professionals to do what they say. At the same time, you want to ensure high quality work and you want to ensure that it's done on a very structured schedule. So what you're talking about specifically there is a payment schedule that we make part of the contract. Okay. And so it's very typical that what we do is we put a time frame on that uh, schedule. And the first golden rule is you always want to stay behind on work uh, or ahead on work and behind uh, behind on payments, if that makes sense. So more work has been done on the property than you've paid out. So, for example, if we put a contractor on three draws, 
right? Three payments. Well, we want to see if we've, uh, if, if 40% of the job is done, well, we want to only have paid out either 30 or 33%, right? If we put them on three payments, we've paid out 33%, but we don't pay until 40% of the construction is done. So you don't pay anything because, even up front at all? Yeah, we do at times, but very rarely. Very rarely because we want to work with contractors who have managed their finances well enough, right? Which is a lot of contractors. Not every contractor, believe me. Uh, but first of all, if a contractor is living literally paycheck to paycheck, that's because generally they haven't necessarily figured out or managed their business well yet. Not to say that that wouldn't change, but if they're literally living paycheck to paycheck, what happens is that you're working with a contractor or a company that's not as financially stable. And when somebody's not as financially stable, they're apt to do things that people that are that are financially stable wouldn't. They're more apt to walk off the job. They're more apt to take a higher paying job and start taking longer on your job. Right. Um, so we always want to have incentives for the contractor to finish and penalties if the contractor drags it out. So we will have, with a lot of our contractors, first of all, we'll always be uh, ahead on work and behind on payments. We always pay our contractors. We do what we say, but we're never, you know, for example, we wouldn't have paid a contractor $20,000 and then they've only done $10,000 in work. That's a problem because somebody who is financially challenged at the time may all of a sudden go start doing another project and totally forget about your project because there's no incentive to to finish. That makes and sense. And so the inc- and incentive has to be aligned. The second thing is if they take longer than they say, they should get penalized. So if your contract is for $20,000 with some framers that are framing a project for you, if they ta- if if they tell you it's a six week project or a three week project or a two well you know that wouldn't be a six week project but if that was a you know a two week project and they quoted that well they should start getting penalized if they don't finish their work and this is always not always but it's generally very very standard accepted practices in the commercial world but in the in the residential world sometimes it's foreign to, you know, smaller mom and pop contractors who want to use their paperwork. So, you know, we have an independent contractor we agreement that ensures that the con, you know, that that shifts the liability of the contractor for what they're responsible for. You know, we have a final lien waiver we want to make sure we get signed. You know, we have a payment schedule that outlines when they get paid and how much of the project needs to be done before they get paid. And it's no different. I mean, uh, on TV, we might make it look easy and it might be fun and, and games, but in real life, I mean, it takes an education to run a, an investing business. And these are the small things that matter. Um, they don't really cover the details on TV because it wouldn't be the most exciting show. But, uh, right. you know, these are the things that, that this is how an education pays you over time because you make less and less mistakes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of the value of having partners or versus doing it all alone. You know, I've had a few times where I do a big deal and I get a big paycheck and it's kind of like, hey, I'm kind of high-fiving myself, you know, like there's no one, <laughs> no one to celebrate with. I, I think from what I can tell from the show, you've always had partners. If you had to do it over again, would you have done it alone? Or do you say, hey, man, if you got someone who you can partner with, do it? I always encourage people not to partner if if they don't have to. And I, I'm not saying partnership. I'm in a partnership, and I draw a tremendous amount of value from it, and I love it, and I would never do it any other way if I were to do it over again. However, um, you know, what's the value of a partnership? The value of a partnership is that you're working with someone you love, you know, working with somebody that you care about, working with somebody that brings greater enjoyment to your life than without them. Um, so it really depends on, on who that person is and what skill sets they bring to the table. So it can be a great thing. It could be a horrible thing. A lot of people partner out of fear when they start out, or they partner because they think somebody is a contractor. Oh, they're a contractor, so that means I should partner with them because they have some knowledge that I don't have. That knowledge can be acquired. You can hire great contractors. You can hire great agents. You can hire great mortgage brokers. Just because somebody has some real estate experience doesn't mean you should partner with them. You should partner with them because they, A, 
can help you financially. They have a track record of success. They have a track record of success maybe in another business. And you think you the two of you can accomplish more together. Let's say you're doing a 50-50 partnership. Well, you can accomplish more together than you can by yourself. Well, the reality is with an education, it gives you confidence. And with confidence, you'll start to realize you don't need to partner. If you're looking for people, you can hire them. You can you can bring them into your business and draw enjoyment from the relationship you have with them where you don't have to necessarily uh, get into a partnership that can be messy at times. I partnered because I wanted to work with my friends. And I at the time, um, from a business standpoint, was that a great decision? Absolutely not. In fact, if I were to give myself advice over again, I'd say, you know, hey, look at possibly doing it another way. Is this something you want to do? However, looking back now, I can say, you know what, I I would do it all over again because they're really good friends. And we partnered not because we thought we could make more money, but because we wanted to work together. And uh, And so I think in reality, all three of us probably could have made more money by ourselves um, had we chosen to do that, but we we sacrificed a little bit of money for a tremendous life enjoyment, right. and and uh, and I'll never regret that decision. And it's something that uh, actually I'm you know it's probably one of been one of one of the greatest benefits of of running a real estate business. Okay, well, so I I just based I'll let you go here. I think you've got another appointment to get to. I had two more simple questions for you, but. Uh, anything else that you want to say ahead of time before we go there, before we wrap up? No, I, I, I think, uh, I think you do a great thing because you're, you're providing people with, with education, and you know, I'm the biggest proponent of education out there. If you want to be a tremendous real estate agent, um, it requires an education. If you want to be a tremendous real estate investor, it requires an education. And then, uh, I, I do want to say one thing because I know probably a lot of agents, a lot of realtors are listening to this podcast. It's a uh, investing is definitely something that you can do as an agent and do both. And and we have a lot of agents who work in our brokerage who do both. Um, obviously, you know we own a brokerage, so we do both businesses, and they, and they actually go very well together. And a lot of agents, when they're in a market long term, start to realize, wait a second, you know I earn this from a commission, which is great, and can be scaled and can be grown. But I can also earn, you know, profits over here from opportunities that come my way. So I encourage every agent, hey, just look at it a little differently. Start to realize that, hey, it doesn't always have to have to be a, a listing commission or it doesn't have to be, you know, something that is in uh, that you're very comfortable with. Look outside the box and start to, you know, own properties, buy properties yourself. You, you have a lot of the knowledge that is is will will get you started long term you got to learn you know really learn a lot about the investment side but if you know how to appraise properties if you know how to comp properties if you know what well, what areas are good you know you you start to gain this intimate market knowledge that's something that every investor has and has to gain so you already have you know the start of something that is required to be successful as an investor and uh so definitely look at both sides, and I encourage every agent to do that. And a lot of agents start to to look at it that way and start to build their own portfolio of properties, and they do both. And it's it's a great it's a great one two punch. That's a good point. There was there was a lot of realtors I know, and there was me too, also for a few years where, you know, I get a great deal comes across my desk, I send it to an investor, they close it. We're sitting at the closing table. You know, I'm making three thousand dollars, for example. They're making forty thousand dollars, for example. And I'm smiling bigger than they are, you know, because I just got my commission. And it took me a while to be like, why why don't I do some of this too, you know? <laughs> exactly. I'm sure yeah, there's a lot it, of realtors in that spot. Yeah, absolutely. There there are. And, uh, you know, realize there's more risk. You're going to have to spend time learning. You know, not every invest. you know, you could lose money on a deal. And the reality is with more, with a little bit more risk comes greater reward. So just start small, start small and then grow from there. And if you like that side and it becomes more profitable, you may end up doing that more than, than just traditional listings and working with buyers. But both can be great because you're acquiring knowledge the whole time. Okay, great. All right. So my two final questions, I like to ask everybody these questions, if you don't mind. Uh, do you have a favorite blog that you read or a podcast that you listen to? You know, I don't listen to, uh, it's awful to say, I don't listen to many podcasts. That's not to mean that there's, there's, 
tremendous uh, opportunities. I'm I'm a book reader. That's just okay. always been the way I've learned. Some people learn through audio books, and and I learn. You know, I set aside time in the morning and evening to read, and um, so I have some great books that I would recommend for sure. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there's podcasts related to these topics, but uh, uh, the E Myth is an excellent book. Uh, the E Myth, written by Michael Gerber. I actually co-wrote a book, The E Myth: Real Estate Investor, with Michael Gerber as well. So depending on what you're looking to do, if you're an agent, uh, you know I'd go out there and get the E Myth. If you're uh, an investor, I'd go out there and get the E Myth: Real Estate Investor. It's on Amazon. Okay. And phenomenal book because it talks about the difference. Really, the, the big what what's the big lesson? is how to go from being a technician in a business to a manager to an entrepreneur, how to go from working in your business to working on your business, which is great for agents. So I'd recommend agents read the EMS or both, and then investors definitely read the, the EMS Real Estate Investor. Um, that's that's obviously a, a, a book geared towards real estate investment. One other book that's been excellent is called Mindset, too. And this is uh, one of my favorite books that I always recommend by Carol Dweck. And that book really changes the way you think about, I would call it a personal development book, um, but it's probably, it's it's more a psychology book. You know, it's going to help you from running a business to parenting. To, I mean, there's so many crossovers to just general life management to your relationships. One of the best books I've ever read about what, you know, a successful mindset looks like and how it's. And that's so important for anybody running a business. Uh, um, so those two books are, are two of my favorite that I would recommend. Okay, good. I've read E-Myth on Darren's recommendation. He probably heard about it from you. And he just told me to get Mindset. So now that you've told me, I guess I'll go out and get it and read it. <laughs> well, you heard it twice. you got to go get it now. <laughs> okay. And all right, my last question is just who is your mentor and how have you thanked them? You know, my, my biggest mentor would probably be my mother. Um, and I don't thank her enough. <laughs> All the ladies <laughs> listening are going, oh. Uh, she, you know, she ran a small business for years, and I learned a lot from her about just discipline and really the value of education. That's probably the one gift that she constantly instilled in me is if you want to be successful in life, there's other people out there that have done it. You know, I attribute everything to my mentors, and I think if anybody do- attributes it any other way, they're probably not being truthful because. We all learn from other people. and You know, Warren Buffett has a mentor and has been mentored over the years. Uh, you know, even the most – every successful investor, every successful business owner has many mentors. And so that's one – that's probably the most important one who taught me, you know, some of the most important life lessons along the way. And uh, I have thanked her. I, I should continue to thank her more. But, uh, you know, I learned a lot just about – but what it takes to be successful, discipline, and how you know how to go out there and seek education, social skills, thing, things that these small intangible skills that are hard to place a value on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I would probably probably say that. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll let you go. I'll wrap it up. I really appreciate you being on the show today. And uh, go call your mom again and tell her thanks. <laughs> and uh, I will. Thank we you, hope Adam. that many of our listeners will come to your event this weekend. So thanks again, Dan. Sounds I appreciate good. you. No, thank you, Adam. Take care. Bye-bye. So thanks, everyone, for listening to the show today. And I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast. And please, please, if you have questions, comments, or anything like that, don't forget to email us at podcast at hermanlondon.com. We always love to hear from people. Helps us get some new content. If you have anyone in particular that you'd like to get uh, on the show and hear us interview, we'd love to do it. Our producer, Joey Vosovich, has been extremely successful at getting great people on here for us to talk with, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Joey. And uh, we look forward to our future shows. And go out and buy and sell some real estate. Thanks, guys. Take care.